Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. It's time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Nubo and Dave Tree. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to episode three of Making Tracks. I'm Mark Newbold, and joining me for our latest episode is, well, do, do your own intro. I don't like doing your intro. I'd rather you did your own. I want you to do my intro. It's not the same. You, you want a big build-up? Yeah. Okay. It's the only one I'll ever get. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, there is that. I mean, I wish I'd prepared for this. I, I, I haven't. But uh, joining me tonight, uh, as he always will, because uh, that's just the way we've conned him, is, is the one and only <laughs> YouTube star sensation, farthest from Supremo, Dave Tree. Hello, Dave. Welcome to the show, your show. Welcome to your own show, Dave. This is the New Forest calling. Hello. How do you do? <laughs> oh, very good. How's the weather in the New Forest? I do have to make an apology to everybody and to yourself, Mark, as well, okay, because okay. you're far too polite and you didn't mention this. I was listening back to the second episode, which was excellent, might I add. Oh, yes. Um, Award winning. But anybody who was listening might have thought that, oh, one of you boys is a really heavy breather. And that was me, except not quite me. I had the fan running in the shop and I didn't think it was being picked up on the microphone. It wasn't until I listened back that there's a lot of <sighs> feedback, heavy breathing noises coming through, which is where the fan rotates on a pivot. So when um, you said so... we've got lots of feedback this episode, it wasn't quite the feedback you expected. Oh, see, look, you're on fire already. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, apologies for anybody listening thinking, what the, what, what's one of them doing? So I switched off the fan tonight. So, but you saying that on the weather, it is like an oven. I'm calling from all the cool stuff. It is extremely hot in here. I do have three condensers running at the moment, which do kick out a lot of heat, but that's a whole another story. But it is lovely tonight. You may be aware, Dave, being a toy retailer, that there's been a bit of an up and down situation with Star Wars at the moment. Last week, it came to a head with Last Jedi actress Kelly Marie Tran deciding to step away from social media. She shut down, I think, I don't know if she shut it down, but she deleted all of her Instagram messages. And it kicked off a whole big storm that basically ended up with the BBC doing an article on their BBC website and then me getting a call from the BBC Radio 5 saying, will you come on our morning show and talk about the situation? So before we, we have a little chat about this, this is me last week on BBC Radio 5 talking about this whole horrible Kelly Marie Tran situation. <laughs> Star Wars. I feel like I should sing to you, kind of hum along to that instead of actually speaking. Uh, it is a, a franchise that brings joy to millions. It spawned its own religion. Um, but when The Last Jedi came out in December, it divided fans. And now, after months of racist and sexist abuse, the Vietnamese-American lead actress Kelly Marie Tran, who starred as the, the mechanic-turned-resistance fighter Rose Tico, has deleted all of her posts on Instagram. Uh, Mark Newbold helps to run the fan website, fanthatracks.com writes for Star Wars Insider magazine. Hello, Mark. Good morning. Bring us up to date, because for people who haven't been following this story, it's not just her deleting her, her Instagram account out of the blue. This is a has been a slow burner over the last few months. Yeah, it has, and it, it, it's, it's not a good fit for Star Wars, really. It's, it's sad that people have taken it to this degree. So Kelly came on board uh, probably about 18 months ago. Uh, we first heard about her being uh, cast in the film. She's an absolute ray of sunshine. She's like a bottle of pop about to go off. She's mm -hmm. brilliant. Uh, but certain factions of the fandom, as we call it, um, are very entrenched in, in old ways. They don't want uh, things to change uh, can't understand that it's a very cosmopolitan galaxy that the stories are set in. So, so to have a, not that you have Vietnamese American people in the Star Wars galaxy, but, but faces that look different, let's put it that way, coming into uh, this 40-year-old this franchise, some people don't want to see it. And so Kelly, for no good reason, because she's, like I say, she's been fantastic with the fans, 
has just really taken the brunt of it, and uh, it, it's come to this, and, and uh, a lot of fans are kind of ashamed almost to be Stars mm. fans at the moment. It's, it's really pathetic. You know, you, you describe that and, and the fact that, that people feel that they don't want to see this change but I mean you only need to take one look at the the bar for God's sake I mean you see faces yeah. there you know, different faces how can they what, what, what's their objection is it is it misogyny is it is it race what is it I think it's just 2018 sadly and it's bled into social media where you get entrenched positions on on left and right and nobody seems to be able to meet in the middle and have a reasonable conversation about anything not that there's a reasonable argument for not having for example, a Vietnamese woman play a role in Star Wars, or a black stormtrooper as John Boyega, or or any other any other thing, or whatever you want to put in there. Because, like you say, you're probably alluding to the cantina scene in Star Wars when you've got a wolf man sitting next to a giant insect drinking a drink with Chewbacca the Wookiee. So, you know, you can't get much more of a mix than that, and and it should be reflected in the casting of the films, especially now as we move forward in the 21st century. It's ridiculous. Mm. Well, Rianne Johnson, the uh, the director, uh, has got involved in all of this. She she described well the word she uses to describe these people is man babies. Yes, that's a very common phrase that gets used. And and Ryan Johnson, like you say, you mentioned that the, the Last Jedi was stiff opinion, and it, and it kind of is a Marmite film, and, and it's by design. He, you know, Ryan said from the off that was what he kind of wanted. He wanted people to be polarised and. It's a different outlook for Star Wars. Some people like it and some people don't, but it's entertainment and we don't have to watch it. We don't have to lose sleep. And there are, as you've used the phrase, there are a lot of man babies out there. It's become a very common phrase. Uh, one at first I kind of thought, really? And then the more you see of these ridiculous opinions floating around on social media, and we're out there all the time on Fanta Tracks, we're talking to people left, right and centre daily. And you do come across these opinions and you've just got to shake your head and think, this is ultimately, I'm 47, I've been into it since I was six. This was made for me when I was six. The fact that I still love it now is a bonus. Uh, it is about space wizards and robots. It's, it's not the United Nations. But by the same token, the mix of characters, the mix of people, races and uh, you know, gender and everything, ages, it should be like the United Nations. That's kind of the point. So people are really just missing the mark here terribly. Mm. Do you think it's just people's strange opinions on the world around them and they've, they've taken Star Wars and used that as their, their canvas? Yeah, I think they probably have, and it's a shame because Star Wars, if nothing else, over the past 40 years has been a wonderful escape because we've all got the drudgery of life, everyone, whatever you do. you know, There's, there's always times when you just want to step out of it for a little bit, and Star Wars has always been the place where people can step out. Some people have stepped further, uh, like me perhaps. You know, Other people have different ways of expressing their love for Star Wars, but generally it's an escape, and when the real world starts encroaching on that, it's not an escape anymore, and it's, it's, it's a terrible shame because it is fun. Uh, but by the same token, all these issues need to be discussed. It, it shouldn't even be a, a consideration that Ryan Johnson wanted to cast a uh, Vietnamese-American actress or J.J. wanted to cast a black stormtrooper, which some people thought was heresy because, you know, uh, they were always not black, let's put it that way. Before. Well, you could never see under the mask. Well, no, no, but they, they've done previous films and they kind of established different things. But it's a huge galaxy. It, it's... Oh, I give up. I don't know why people think this way and it's just it's really come to a head with this and it's such a shame that's such a nice I've never met Kelly but I've, I've seen her at close quarters and she was wonderful with the fans and for her to feel pushed into the corner that she needs to step away from Instagram like like Daisy Ridley did a couple of years ago she mm. took a lot of flack as well um, it, it's not a good fit for Star Wars I think it, it doesn't do the fandom any good at all I think it's kind of sad no, thank you, Mark. Uh, Mark Newbold, who uh, runs the fab, uh, fan website that he was talking about there, fantatracks.com, and writes for Star Wars Insider magazine. As you can hear there, I didn't realise until I played it back how pissed off I sounded, because generally I'm pretty up, but when I played it back, <laughs> when I played it back, I thought, good grief, I, I really sounded quite down about it. So it's it's just a lousy situation. What you hear, You've hear, you just heard me rub it on about what I think. What do you think about this? Genuinely... This is just a symptom of something much larger going on that I genuinely firmly believe. It's not so much that there's the good or the bad with like Star Wars, although that is what the arguments seem to be concerned about. It's actually more the fact that we have taken social media to another level that people don't know when to switch off or, or disengage from it and i think that is really the, the big problem from here pre-internet you got your news in say one of three ways you got it either as a newspaper from the radio or tv 
newspaper, it was always like someone's point of view. You picked what newspaper you'd want to like buy and you didn't necessarily read it all. You know, you might not have picked it up, you know, if it, if it was on a table, on the radio. If you weren't tuned in, you've missed it, but you only hear it once, even yeah. if you did listen to it, because they then get on with the rest of the schedule and the program. Watching it on the TV, you know it's only at certain times of the day. It's not like just continuous OK, so you either caught it or you didn't. You either made time to sit down and catch up on the world affairs. How culture has got itself sucked into right now, even back then, if you didn't agree with something, you just kind of shouted at the telly or, or the radio and you moved on. With social media, if you don't catch those things when they happen, all it does is just waits until you log in because it gives you these updates of all these things that you need to read and see about. And all of this like pool of negativity is just literally being bombarded at you continuously. Yeah. You know, there is no escape. And what happens is you're not going on there to be entertained. You're not going on there to like even catch up with your friends. You are just literally rammed with opinions. And the worst thing about it is that you can actually participate. It doesn't then become a debate because all you're doing is you're spouting your opinion. And then if the person you're replying to doesn't see your opinion, it just stores it up for when they're back on. And all you're doing is you're just compounding this whole thing even more yeah. because it never dies. It never is put to bed and nobody ever moves on because it just keeps going round and round and round and round. I firmly believe, I mean, this is going way off what we're talking about, but with what's happening to Kelly, I wouldn't be at all surprised if within a few years, measures have been brought in, particularly for kids, that they're saying that this is there's too much of this and it's bringing people to a point where, you know, you cannot switch off, you, you cannot escape this thing. All of these arguments, 99% of them, are just completely pointless. Like, really, hand on heart, yeah, we, we all are passionate about these things, but ultimately, we're not talking like world famine, starvation, natural disasters. The things that are all argued and debated about are not things that are actually critical to our lives and, you know, where there's bigger things going on, you know, like with wars and stuff like that. Um, and we're almost kind of blinkered to what is actually going on because we're just going round and round in circles. We're still arguing about Last Jedi and it's six months on. We should have completely like, forgotten all of that and like be like jumping on solo and saying how great it is. But because you've got that hangover, it's now affected like solo. Yeah. It's now affecting the people involved with it, be it like Kelly or like last week where there was like a, a, a ridiculous amount with like happy birthday Kathleen Kennedy oh, yeah. and like for crying out loud it's someone's birthday why would you do that what what is actually the matter with you the matter is it's it's social media you know people aren't being able to kind of make that distinction anymore you are just literally prodding the bear continuously in terms of Star Wars then do you think that makes Star Wars as, as a place to visit to as a place of escapism I described it on the radio as like a bolt hole to go when things when the rest yeah. of the world's not particularly enjoyable. You, you dive into your Star Wars, you read or watch or play or whatever you want to do. Do you think it's making Star Wars weaker by just making it an, not a fun place to be, not a fun place to want to just express your opinion about a film that you love? for fear of it, being flamed and knocked down? Yeah, it is It is to a degree because all feedback is good. I genuinely live for feedback, I know, good or you, bad. You always do at the shows. You always do. And, you know, sometimes you don't want to hear what you get told, but without hearing it, you don't improve. It does come a point where the feedback is not constructive. And in the sense of what Kelly as an actress She's been propelled into something that's, you know, her big break. There is a degree that you have to accept that you, know, you can only please some of the people some of the time. That's right. Yeah. Um, you can't please ev everyone. If you're in that industry, you have to know that you are going to be leveled a, a, a load of criticism from people you've never even heard or seen or ever engaged with. But for whatever reason, they just have to do that. Especially um, in a Star Wars film. There, there, there is a degree, yeah, with fandoms and stuff like that. Yeah. But also at the same time, a lot of it is just like silliness. I mean, people say it's like cyberbullying and stuff like that. But to me, it's, it's really not that. It's like literally because we're not able to let go. Even pre 
social media, yeah. when things got out of hand on a forum, it would just be locked down and done. Nobody's moving on, and I think this is what's going to be happening. And, and we're saying this within the realms of Star Wars, but there's probably like 50 other things that are sharing similar traits right now that are happening in in a you know it's got that same algorithm and it's and it's like yeah. literally the whole kind of you cannot disengage with facebook with twitter instagram is a little bit easier because all it is is pictures with like text and stuff like that but you can still reply to to the image uh, it's not the same amount of interaction but twitter and facebook in particular are just literally these boiling pots and people say that it's like hatred and you see like racism it's like it's not it's it's just literally not allowing things to die. I, I really don't think it's as, as insidious as that. And all I can compare it to is things like radio and TV. You know, it's gone. You either catch the news or you don't. It's, it's gone. It's moved on. You don't necessarily react to it. You don't talk to, you know, the radio newscaster and say, well, actually, you, you're full of or whatever when all they're doing is their job. We've got to a point where we have to be heard, but ultimately... What difference does that make? But it's also sat there waiting for you the moment you like log on. You know, it's it's it's, it's just there. And I I feel for Kelly and I feel for Kathleen. And George went through all of this with people's like backlash and stuff like that. But I think we said on the previous episode, could you imagine when Phantom Menace came out and if Facebook was still around, like yeah. you know, it'd be just like crazy. I would say from what I've seen, the anger is heavier with Last Jedi than anything you ever saw with like the, any of the prequel stuff. Um, and I think it's just it's silly. It's like, okay, that's fine. You've still got all these other films that you like, so that's why, cool. Why, why take it out on Solo? A lot of guys' argument was we don't want a Vietnamese-American actress in the film. We, there's too many women in the film. That was a, a thing that these people would say. So what do they do? They harm by not turning out the next film that stars a yeah. guy which you think they would support so the backwards logic yeah. of it all makes uh, no sense either yeah i mean that 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 to me is it's just childish you know it's 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 literally like for crying out loud like you, you are penalizing the wrong thing yeah. and if you wanted to vote with your wallet which is what people have been saying then you don't buy the home theater release of last jedi though i mean i'm sure it's been affected by it nonetheless but if you wanted to make a point, you vote with your wallet in that sense and you support something different. The Last Jedi is still going to be made like a bucket load of cash versus like Solo. Solo, they'll be looking at that and go, well, that was a flop. And then you've, you've literally stemmed the chances of any further development of that. Whereas if Solo had made money, then it's kind of like, OK, well, these are cool. Let's like explore what we've got here where do we take things you know do we take things with kira with lando with han uh do we do like a, a prequel to beckett it's all these things but at the moment they'll just be looking at the last thing and they'll be going well that didn't work but the last jedi did let's do more of that and then the people who've like done all this just completely shot themselves in the foot Oh, Mark. I know. When did we come such, like, griping, miserable... But we're just as bad, we're, you know, in a weird way. We're oh, yeah. actually part, part of that. But I acknowledge that. You know, before anybody does point out, I, I'm fully aware. But what I always try to do with anything that I'm involved with is actually always give it a balanced, fair perspective with anything when it comes to like toys and people go you know about the toys so, okay right well let's have a look at the business side of things to like try and get a little bit of understanding and then you might have an understanding as to why they got to that yeah. it doesn't always is the case you know sometimes you are just like thinking <laughs> what was the logic behind that yeah. but if you can just literally stand back for two minutes and look at things objectively, then number one, it isn't as bad as you make out. And number two, you become a little bit more empathic and you can sort of understand things and it doesn't bother you. But all of these people just get their underwear in a twist because the moment that they do anything, they are bombarded. You know, you're not escaping any of these things. That is really what the problem is. It's not, not to do with the productions, the fandoms or anything like that. You are just not given a chance to let this thing die. It's Tuesday night. Time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. Welcome to Making Tracks. 
We're going to step over to a couple of weekends ago at Birmingham Film and Comic Con, Showmasters event at the NEC. You were there working because you were running a stall. Uh, yeah. I had the opportunity at the lunchtime to sit down with Richard Hutchinson, Richard Mitchell, Martin Keeler and Carl Bayliss and the five of us sat down, talked about what we'd thought of Solo, what we were doing at the show. This is us in a very noisy uh, food area having a bit of a chat about Star Wars, which is why we're all here. So we're sitting in a, uh, is this a restaurant? Would you call this a restaurant? Uh, a high class restaurant, food eating area. <laughs> We're at the Ivy at the NEC uh, on the morning of the first day of Collector Mania, and and I've got uh, I've got Richard Hutchinson, I've got Martin Keeler, I've got Richard Mitchell, I've got Carl Bayliss, and me uh, sitting at a table talking about Star Wars. Martin's just made a very good point: the fact that whether we like certain films or don't like certain films, that there's a conversation to be had, which is really cool. Elaborate quickly on that point because it's worth making. Yeah, so we're just sitting here at the moment at a time where it seems there's a lot of, still a lot of debate about Star Wars and there still seems to be quite a lot of anger. And um, I was just harking back to the time where the thought of even having a new Star Wars film to discuss was a dream come true. Um, So it just feels a bit weird that there's so much discussion that's causing a lot of aggro and I'm just in a place of, I'll keep watching it, keep sending it. Thank you very much. Zen like bliss. Yes. Yeah, Zen like bliss. So, Carl, you just said, yes. I'm, I'm quoting you now, you just <laughs> said that on certain days your favourite film could be Rogue One, on other days it's Empire. Yeah. Richard, you just said that you you enjoyed The Last Jedi an awful lot and you get more out of it on every viewing. Yep. Everyone's got a different opinion. That's got to be a positive thing. That shouldn't be a thing that people are kicking off about. What do you think about that, Rich? Yeah, it's a good point. Like saying, it's, it's, everyone has their favourites and everyone probably has the one they hate that will dislike the most shouldn't say hate yeah. does it no, uh, yeah it's, it's good that there's a you can have the discussion and you can have your own opinions yeah. rather than some of the ones that other people because yeah. <laughs> it does like you say it's been that kind of toxic atmosphere which is no fun so we've all seen Solo so and, and we've talked about it on the show before so there's no worries about spoilers if you should have seen it if you haven't seen it go and see it Richard what was your first impression of that film I came out of Solo and immediately I thought that was a good film, but for me it was an EU kind of story that's been transferred into a film. I'd recently read a couple of the Brian Daly novels and I came out of uh, Solo thinking, it's one of those films, I'm not keen to go back and watch it. However, I did. I went back two days later, came out of it and I thought, no, that's far better than my first impression. It's definitely grown on us. There's so much in that movie that's probably going to take me another three or four times to see everything that's actually in there. Oh, it was a wonderful film. That's good. I think I think we all thought the same. It's, it's one of those films that could grow the more you, yeah. the more it opens up, and the more little Easter eggs come out. Why do you think then, Martin? Why do you think it's not connected with the audience? Um, so I think there's a real lack of awareness that this film's out. I think if you remember when it was announced, it was going to be solo. Even amongst the fans, there was a. I'm not sure that's a film I'm I'm queuing up to see. And it's a shame because I think it's one of those films, and I was like that, I was kind of like, it wasn't a film I particularly needed, but I'll go and see it because it's Star Wars. And it's a really great film. And it's almost a shame it's about Solo because if it was a new Star Wars thing, there was a big hoopla about, it's a new thing, you've got to see it and all that sort of thing, it would work. But I was talking to some people I shared with you earlier, that talking to people at work and they were like saying, oh, is there a new Star Wars film? They didn't even know. And then it was followed by, oh, well, I can't get to see it because I've still got to see Avengers. I've still got to see... It's almost like there's an order. And Solo was third. And the cinemas are still full of people. Watch, I went to see Deadpool this week. It was packed. I, I know I sent a comedy picture of it empty, but we were the first ones there. By the time the film came on, it was packed. So it's almost like there's a to-do list. And Solo's at the bottom, if you even know it's on there. Yeah. So I work in a school... 1,400 students and nobody's talking about Solo. Nobody's even aware it exists. I went to the cinema... There wasn't even a poster outside. There was posters for Deadpool, there was posters still for Avengers, but there was nothing for Solo. So I went in the lobby, there was no merchandise, no cups, no, you know, some yeah, things that you see at other cinemas. There was we, nothing we the, there at all. The promotion the has been same non-existent. Same my local Odeon. It's like, there was no major posters. You've seen the, the really nice cardboard you know, installations in some of the bigger yeah. chains um, and some of the biggest s- screens. I mean, this is a 10 cinema multiplex in, you know, sort of the West Midlands, a really big shopping centre sort of place. Not really any outward advertising of it. Again, 
the the only thing the Odeon were doing, which they are very cool, are the exclusive cards. The cards yeah. But again, it was like confusion amongst the staff about what they were giving out, when they were giving them out, yeah. things like that. So it it, do, it does seem to have uh, almost shot itself in the foot, yeah. marketing wise. So the thing for me, which I've observed, I, I'm lucky that I go to the cinema quite a lot. I am absolutely bored to tears with seeing the Harry Potter trailer. I'm bored to tears of seeing the Jurassic World trailer. I'm still yet to see a solo trailer. Not seen one ever before. So why the disconnect? Why do you think Disney have dropped the ball on this? Because clearly they have. Because, as I say, Jurassic World's not out till Wednesday in the UK. We've been getting TV spots for a fortnight. Solo came out last week. I think I saw one, and I watch a lot of telly. So why do you think they've... Is it arrogance? Do you think they just assume people are going to go and see a Star Wars film, or do you think they, they've got no confidence in it because of the, obviously, issues they had making it? I, what do you, what do you I, think the disconnect I think, is? I think, I think they're possibly tuned in to a lot of the social media debate that's been going on for, you know, obviously they've had the, the you know, change of director uh, and things like that from their side, but the fact that the, the whole sort of fan response to it has been Alden's not Harrison Ford and as, as Martin's already said you know solo do we need a solo film eh, you know well, do you think do you think then when Rogue One came out nobody knew what a Rogue One was you know and, mm. and that worked went over gangbusters because it was wasn't about a central it wasn't called Jin or, or Urso it was it was you know a, a group of characters do you think solo would have worked better if it had been you know Star Wars Underworld for example or pick a name you know or something like that I, I, I disagree with that because I think thinking back to Rogue One, I was feeling exactly the same. No trailers, there was nothing there for Rogue One. And I don't think Disney are being arrogant here. I just think their focus is on the episodic movies. And I think we're going to see a lot in the lead up to nine. And I think in an ideal world, I don't think Disney would have wanted this movie coming out now. I think they've not planned it correctly and it may have been better pushing it back another three months, but they couldn't afford to do that. Um, and I, I wouldn't say it's arrogance at all. I just think that they've got the market and the whole campaign wrong. Yeah, I wouldn't argue with that. And I think there's a bit of perspective, because we talk about it being a, a failure and all that sort of thing. You know, it's not a film that's bombing like you wouldn't believe. It's not making the money that you would hope, but it's not like a... I don't think they're going to be weeping, wondering if the studio is going to be brought down because it's only made the amount of millions that it's made. And I think the bit for me that is really important is it's a really good film. So... I wonder if it's going to have, I think I saw the quotes, Jumanji-type legs. Not necessarily the cinema, but I'm wondering if this will be a film that just constantly sits on the radar of everyone. I, I know I've already come to the conclusion, that Solo, when it comes out on Blu-ray, it's probably the one that if I've got nothing to do on a Sunday evening, I'll watch just to park my brain and have another crack. I find Rogue One, I love it to death, but I have to be in the mood for it. The episode films... Funny enough, I don't watch really outside of going to the cinema because it's hard work for me because I'm going to have to watch too much. Solo's the one. That if, I think actually the best example, if I'm late, late at night in a hotel, Solo's on TV, I'll watch it till the end. That, that makes sense, that makes sense. So quickly just to talk about the, the film itself, what elements of the film worked for everybody, what characters worked, what scenes worked? I'll, I'll ask you, Richard, what, what worked for you? Uh, I'd say L3 was brilliant. Definitely. It's a, a completely new droid, completely different look for a droid, and a great uh, attitude. Yeah. I think it was the best word for it. To see the droids being a big, an even bigger character than C3PO or R2 were. A really big character. That's, that's interesting because I thought back to the very opening of the original film when 3 pos panicking about being sent to the Spice Mines of Kessel and it seemed like a really random thing to say and now you realise it was full of droids and that's clearly where they all get sent. So so that kind of makes some sense. Carl, what did you think? What was your favourite element of the film? Um, I thought, I thought all, 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 the, all the lead cast were brilliant. Um, picking up on what Richard said, L3 I absolutely loved. I thought there was sort of elements of uh, K2SO in there yep. with the sort of deadpan sarcasm which anybody that's watched any of Phoebe Waller-Bridge's other sort of acting comedic roles that's very much her so it's it's not a it, all, it almost looks like the, the droid was written for her rather than her being cast in that role being, yeah. her being cast in the role so I, I just I just think all the all the lead actors uh, pulled off what they were supposed to pull off Donald Glover was brilliantly cool as Lando yep. um, Alden carried the sort of 
young, naive Han Solo. You know, you don't want him to be Harrison Ford. That's He's true. not Harrison Ford yet. It's years of being a smuggler. You know, he's that growing turn, into his cynicism, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, it, that, that's what turns him into the character that he is. Yeah, you know, every, everybody's shaped by the events in their lives, and though this, you know, we're starting to see the first few setbacks and kickbacks that he has. Um, I think Eunice is getting better and better as Chewie. Um, really, in this movie, really captures the mannerisms um, and the humour. I know a lot of people criticise the humour in Last Jedi, but the humour for me really hits the mark. It's it's sarcastic when it can when it needs to be. It's witty yeah. little nods without being in your face comedy. Like a bottom style slap around the face with the frying pan yeah. level. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. Richard, what do you think? <laughs> um I think all of the cast were absolutely fantastic. I couldn't fault any of them, but for me, Kira is the character that I'm most interested in because the way it ended, I'm now wondering what can they do with Kira. I think Amelia Clark is too big a character to, um, you know, too big an actress to just dismiss in a one-off movie. So I can see her character continuing, whether she's going to end up being a Sith or a Dark Jedi or something like that. I'd be really interested in that because I thought that character there um, had so many different levels on it that I didn't pick up on them the first time round. But the second time I watched it, I started to think, you know, she, is she using Han to get off from, um, oh, I've got, yeah, Corellia? Is she, is she, is she scheming things already that far back? When did more get in contact with Kira? You know, there's so many different possibilities in that, um, and that's what I'm really expecting to see. But I thought Alden in particular was really good massive massive shoes to fill and not once did I think that's not Han Solo that's yeah. not Harrison I'm yeah. missing Harrison in fact actually if anything I would have liked to have seen an even younger version right at the start because yeah. to me it was very Oliver Twisty and I was picking up Oliver Twist all the way through the start of it and I thought you know what there's the Fagin character with Lady Proxima and I, and I thought you know it would be nice I wouldn't want them to sing in you know Food Glorious Food or anything like that but, <laughs> but I thought it would have been good to see a much younger five, six, seven year old uh, version of Han being pushed around being well, booted around Yes, yes, almost. So I thought, I thought that would have been great, but no, the whole lot was fantastic, and I want to see more of Kira. Good point. Martin, what do you think? Uh, it kind of goes full loop. I'm, I'm with you on Kira, because although I didn't want a solo movie, I really want a solo sequel, yeah. because if nothing gets made now, I'm gonna, it's going to do my head in, wondering how yeah. on earth that all played out, particularly Kira's character, because... The mother we, of the mother of Sith dragons. We, we, we know she's not around by the new hope, a new hope, or something's happened, and it seems like there's a, real, there's a real story to tell there. And it also, it just fills in my head. What happens to her is the final piece of the puzzle that turns Solo into the Solo we knew. Yes. They completely, I'm not getting involved and almost so anti, it's frightening. He ended the film slightly like that, but as she said, he's still the good guy. When we meet him in A New Hope, he's really not the good guy. He thinks he's burned by something and I'm very keen. It's interesting, I think, when if, you, if this one was a standalone and there was never going to be a sequel with ever any intention, you'd go, well, you know how he won the Falcon and you know why Lando's peed off with him and he, everything's set up to, to not do a sequel. But by the same token, like you guys both said, the Kira thing, you, you want to know, you want to know where that goes. And also the, the whole situation of the underworld, they're talking about... Uh, they're talking about Tatooine, so that's getting mentioned. So you've got the hot elements, and they get mentioned, and all these different cartels get mentioned. Crimson Dawn. I don't know if Black Sun got a mention. I don't think it did, did it? But you know, a lot of these cartels get mentioned, so they're setting a lot of things up. They've been very cute the way they've done the script. Um, I, I definitely want to see more. I, I came out grinning like a loony from that one. So uh, because, like you say, it's an easy watch. It's one of those films that could just put on any time and, and just roll into it and and have fun with it. So. Before we head back out into the hall and start mooching around and doing whatever we do, just going around the table again, why are you all here? What are you specifically here to see, Richard? Um, I'm a vintage Star Wars collector, but I come to these places not expecting to get any vintage Star Wars. It's just more about meeting up with friends and meeting up with people who are, you know, I've met quite a few times selling things on the stalls. So for me, it's, it's all the community engagement side of it. Echo that, um, although I'm not so much of a vintage collector, or I do well, uh, but I do like to get autographs. Um, Aid Edmondson's a big draw to me on this one, and I've already met him, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and I shall be doing a few more photos later. Richard? Uh, I'm a modern collector, so a couple of bits I've seen I'm going to be up today. And same as Martin, Aid is the big draw for an autograph. So that was it. Um, just, it's a nice local show for me, so I just pop down just to see my fellow Panthers. 
How sweet. And I'm here because you all told me I had to be here. <laughs> so, Somebody needs to organise us. I was going to say something. <laughs> yeah. I, I stood at that door yeah. handing out wristbands like it was candy. It was quite fun, yeah. actually. I quite like that. No, yeah, it's come like, back, it's, Claire. All is forgiven. Yes. Where are you, Claire? <laughs> no, no, no impressions this week. Um, <laughs> That, that got me into hot water. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so we'll wrap this little segment up. We're going to go back out there and start seeing what we can see, but uh, on with the show. So that was us just chewing over the fat. We've talked about Solo before. We love the film. It's a disappointment that it's not done better at the box office, but I think there's a lot of factors for that. It, it's a shame. I, I feel passionately that this is really is in the top echelons of, of all Star Wars films, and I really wish more people were cottoning onto it because... It just doesn't seem to have connected. It seems to be a marketing thing, doesn't it? It's certainly not anything to do with the quality of the film. It's quite a strange one. I mean, I'll, I'll even go as far to say I actually feel like it's the best one that Disney's done um, mm. for me because it's a perfect stepping on point. You don't need the prior knowledge of everything else. And I love, don't get me wrong, I love, 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 love Rogue One. That, to me, was was better than Force Awakens, than Last Jedi. But yeah. the more I think about it, the more... I feel Solo has the right bedrock for so much in terms of scope for things like video games, for yeah. comics, for novels. Yeah. You know, you, you've literally been introduced to all these great characters and sort of like background information and stuff like that, that you can just literally flesh out so much of that you probably is off limits that you have on the... Um, the sequel trilogy that they it's like, no, you can't really explore down those roads because we yeah. need to, you know, we're still developing episode nine and things like that. But with this, I, I would say you've got much more creative freedom to, to do all kinds of stuff. Also where you don't need that prior knowledge, you know, you take it at face value. I, I think is a much more entertaining thing. And for, for me, that's really gutting because there's so many great product opportunities within that, that will probably never come about because of it being seen as it's not been the best box office success, so there's no point in developing further product for it. That's kind of upsetting because I think it, it's... It's what we've wanted to see since we were about seven. That's what it is. It's, it's, you wanted to see some of these Han Solo adventures. And, and, and I think, I think you know, you look back to when Marvel... Oh, we had Weekly, but obviously Marvel in the States got beyond the film, and the first story after the Star Wars adaptation was a Han and Chewie story. And so all these years, we've wanted to learn how they met and wanted to see how they met. And we've kind of had it alluded to. But now to see it and, and it to be so good, it's kind of galling that there is the chance that we might not see more of it. This might be it, you know. And if this is it, then that's fine. And I think if you only ever have the sense that this is all Disney wanted to do, that would be fine as well. But I, I get the sense that Disney felt like they were setting out on another little spike off from the franchise. You know, it's like, you know, the Fast and Furious are getting there. They're the Rock and Jason Statham are doing a little <laughs> spin-off. You know what I mean? And if that works, yeah. if that works, then that'll, that'll be great and they'll do something as well as the Fast and Furious. You know what I'm saying? And it felt like Solo yeah. could have been like that because you've got the whole underworld to dive into now and everybody's talking about a FET film and we hear all these rumours of full-size hut models being built and all these little rumours that float around and you know and you've got to start thinking now well is any of that going to come to fruition but moving back to positivity because you know that's what we want to talk about last week I was very lucky I had a good hour chatting with details so D has been in all of the new Disney era films he was Kratinus in The Force Awakens he played roles in Rogue One uh, and he's also in Solo he's Key Tolsite or although I called him Key Tolsite and he corrected me it's not Key it's Quay even though it's spelled Key oh. Q-U-A-Y and he said Key and somebody at Lucasfilm went, oh, no, we pronounce it Quay, even though it's spelt Key and should be said Key. It's Quay. Ah. So it's Quay Tolsite, which, which I needed to remember, so I had to lock that in my head. So uh, this is me and Dee. This is the first 10 minutes of our chat. We spoke for an hour. This is the first 10 minutes. So you get 10 minutes here on Making Tracks. Come back to Phantom Tracks tomorrow. Martin is editing together the other 50 minutes of our conversation, which will be going out on Phantom Tracks TV. So you can listen to that on our YouTube channel. So first 10 minutes now. Next 50 minutes tomorrow on the site. Here's me and Dee rabbiting on about Star Wars. Life treating you well? Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> I, can't, I can't complain. I'm in a Star Wars movie. <laughs> I know. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, I'm trying to think. I was trying to think when, when we spoke last. When was that? Was that for Force Awakens or? I think oh, it was Force Awakens. Yeah. Wow. How long, how long ago does that seem? I, I'm not even counting. I'm not even counting. <laughs> 
I refuse. I refuse to count. I refuse I to count of those. Um, it's yeah, insane. It, it's not giving me much time to think in between, you know, um, which is good. Yeah, uh, that's mm. probably a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just moving straight on from one to the other. Yeah, this one was a, was a bit heavy. Yeah, I think it, I think it got me. It got me a little bit just before we had our cast and crew screening. Yeah, it was. Um, I think it was that night. Everything I, I kind of took on board. Everything that I've been doing the whole journey and to this one great character. But it's the Kessel Run. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's 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 proper Star Wars lore, isn't it? I mean, there's there's certain key points and waypoints and moments that you think. That's pretty iconic, but the Kessel yeah. Run. I mean, that's that's right up there, isn't it? It's the Kessel Run. Um, it's a pike, and yeah. I'm doing scenes. I'm doing scenes with Han and Chewie, and then L3, uh, Kira, and then Beckett, and yeah. just and I'm in a room full of droids. <laughs> that room, room was amazing. Droids. And you know what? You know, obviously, us guys are always talking about the story and, and and all that sort of stuff. And I said to the guys the other day, and it never occurred to me until. Maybe two days ago, that scene, the very first scene of Star Wars, when 3PO is panicking and he goes, we'll be sent to the Spice Mines of Kessel or smashed into who knows what. And now you know why he panics about being sent to the Spice Mines of Kessel, because he just doesn't want to be around all those other droids, does he? <laughs> During that whole year last year, I um, I had time to kind of... And, and it's funny, every time I'm involved in one of these films now, there I get these moments halfway through production or beginning or, or middle or the end where I just watch, I binge watch um, my Star Wars. Not like I need an excuse to do it, but it, it, it is an excuse to do it. Yeah. And that that line, that line got me. That line was like, oh, you spice, spice, because I'm like, I stood there for a second. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I run that place. Well, I, I did run that place by the time you're talking about it, but I run that place. Yeah. So, but I have, I have a mental association to it. But yeah, you know, it's it's like the other thing. The, um, the other thing was when 3PO says, I don't know where your ship learned to communicate and blah, 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 blah. But it has the strangest. When 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 3PO is say, saying that, for the whole of last year, I was trying to find a way to, to speak to Phil and Chris. And then it was Ron. Yeah. <laughs> yes. and, and, and just find a moment to say, dude, I've got this idea about the Falcon. <laughs> You know, I think I think that the reason why it makes that 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 journey in in twelve parsecs is because it's got an artificial intelligence in there. You know, and because it communicated with three PO, I was thinking all of that, and I never got to say it. And then I sit there and I watch this movie, and I'm like, of course, I didn't have to tell them nothing. But but my but that one little gem that had been bugging me the whole year that I just wanted, I felt like I needed to contribute, and I yeah. wanted to say something, and I couldn't. It was being taken care of. It was kind of poetically, uh, poetically sound. So it's Did cool. you feel like that with this film? Because, because certainly as a fan, and you're a fan, obviously, you know all the all the little moments, all the little nods and winks. It feels like it's been written by folks who really, really get it. Especially with this one more than any of the others, in a way. It's the Casdens, man. What you were, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? It's the Casdens. It's like. You know, it's their home. It's their playground. You know, George trusts Lawrence Kasdan. Lawrence Kasdan trusts his son. Um, George trusts Kathy Kennedy. Whoever George trusts, I'm with. End of. Um, and it's kind of like it was very much a different kind of film to make this yeah. time for, for several reasons. One, I felt like it was the perfect cross between a live action and animation. Yeah. And I felt like I was in, sometimes I felt like I was in a Rebels movie or I was on a Rebel set and I was expecting to see Kanan or somebody yeah. just stroll, stroll past. Or what, but just the tone, the, the set builds, the pace of the movie, it just reminded me of Rebels so much. Um, and yet everything was live action. You know, the streets of Corellia, that overview that we have, yeah. that reminds me of the opening sequence on the first episode of Rebels when Ezra is jumping on the rooftops and whatnot. Yeah. It was just beautiful for that energy and to, and to feel like I had a connection to it because I knew that the, the animation, I know that the animations are canon. I know that something you'll see in the animations, you'll see here. Sure. And this was before I even knew anything about Quay. And so um, there was that that going on. But then there was also this thing where I kind of, it's, how do I put it? It's, um, 
Yeah, I can't say any better than this. I couldn't stop geeking out. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't stop geeking out, freaking out. You know, I don't know. I don't think there were any moments where I caught glimpses of bits of dialogue yeah. um, that made me freak out. But just the sets, that computer room set, you got Jimmy V in a gonk droid strolling <laughs> out of a wall, you know, had me transfixed, you know, and this is when I was looking at the monitor trying to watch myself. I forgot yeah. I was on the monitor and I was watching Jimmy walk out the wall, <laughs> you know, and then um, then there were R2 droids and then you had Nathan and Stephanie and, and the other guys in, in their droid costumes. Then you had other droids that were pushing buttons on the walls, which were just puppeteered, you know, so there was no one inside them. It was just puppeteered from the other side. There was just so much going on. And on the computer screens, they had already videoed certain sequences for Chewie and Han and um, the breakout. And I saw one glimpse of a Wookiee. I don't know if it's in the film, but I saw on the screen, this Scott told me, oh, keep an eye on this. Keep an eye. Watch this moment. Watch this moment. And I saw a, a Wookiee punch a guard in the chest and then guard go flying. Yeah. <laughs> So you know he's on a wire, but he went flying and sold that punch. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> they, they, they pre-shot all this. This is all ready to go. But no, it was very difficult not to geek out. And then when we were filming on Savarine in Spain, I'm on a set. I'm in a desert. The wind is blowing across Han and Chewie. And Chewie's fur is just looking like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. Just, you know, there were so many moments and I was struggling to hold it down. I was struggling a lot because there were things that I was getting excited about and I could turn to someone and say it and they wouldn't know that bit about Star Wars. You yeah. know, I remember in the in the sabac room, I think it was the makeup ladies, maybe um, they were commenting on, on this box on the side of the wall that glowed and had like this like white light in some kind of design on there. You know, saying, oh, maybe that's like a space um, cigarette machine, <laughs> you know? And I said, no, that's a droid sensor. That kind of says that the droids can't go past this point, you know, and that's just from a new hope. But it was there. They built it. They put it there, <laughs> you know? But of course they did. And so it was just things like that. I was just losing my mind. The impression I've got, having spoken to a couple of other guys that worked on the film as well, to a man, Everybody said it was their best experience working on the films, that they had the most fun, they built the coolest stuff, that just everything about it was just a dream. So clearly, I'm, I can see you're buzzed about it. So I'm, I'm assuming that's exactly how you felt. There was a day where we were filming um, for the Savarine in Spain. Chaz, the guy that built the swoop bikes, yeah. had a couple parked. <laughs> just had a couple parked. And I spent half a day sitting on one. I just wouldn't move. I wouldn't move. And it's meticulously built from real aircraft, real racing cars. It's got everything. And sitting on it, I couldn't envisage how it was going to look or how it was going to work in the movie. But I could sit on it and envisage what it must have been like shooting Return of the Jedi. Just moments. And, and I was and I was so I was so on it, you know, when we were out there. Um, in Spain or when we were anywhere, even if I wasn't being used that day, I, at least I sat and watched what was going on. Yeah. It, you know, in my head, it was my home behind the scenes. It was uh, that kind of thing. So I loved it. So that's all for this week's episode of Making Tracks. I think we've covered a lot of ground today. I think we've talked about a lot of stuff. We've caught up with details. You've listened to me, Babylon Radio 5. We've put the world to rights. I think we've reinvented social media. So I think we've done a lot today. Yeah, this one's been pretty deep. This is what happens when I don't have that fan running in here, blowing cool air onto me. I then get worked up and I get fired up and then... You're so... Mr. Angry from the Steve Wright show in the 90s, aren't you? That's what you are. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> was it, it wasn't that one, was it? But like, uh, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I've got to throw the fan Hello? <laughs> They're probably thinking, oh, these weirdos. And as always, Mark, you're killing it with these interviews. Absolute knockout content. It makes me almost sound like I'm credible. Let's not be <laughs> ridiculous, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Thank you for uh, having me along again for the ride. It's um, fine. It was Sunday night. Everyone else had gone out or had gone to bed. And, that's and true. Thought, your, your little icon flashed up on Skype, and I thought, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Yeah. Like, you know? Yeah, is, is he sober? Um, yeah. You know, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Tell us what you think, guys and yeah. girls. You yeah, know. We, we like the feedback, the the friendly <laughs> typed feedback, not the uh, fan in the microphone feedback. Yeah, let us know what you think. Let us know. Uh, five star reviews are always nice on Apple Podcasts. So give us oh, five yeah. star reviews. Doesn't matter where you are in the galaxy. Five star reviews would be nice. You can find us at uh, basically anywhere on social media. It's Fanthatracks. So it's very very easy. You can email us news at fanthatracks.com. You can contact us however you like. You can turn up at Dave's shop in the New Forest and knock on his window. Yeah. And we'll be here. We'll be back in two weeks. Until then, Dave, where can people find you apart from in the basement of your shop? Yeah, every time you've asked me this, I've been like, oh, well, you can find me on like YouTube. But when you say this, you're actually like saying like, you know, my social media handles, aren't you? Well, I, I mean, however, smoke signals. Well, I, you know, see, I'm so inexperienced on this stuff because I, I honestly thought, well, yeah, well, you're so well uh, informed on social media. I assumed you were like uh, almost like a mini booker, like a social media guru. But uh, no, maybe I could be wrong. No. The moral of today's episode is disengage from social media <laughs> <laughs> to lead a sane and normal life. Actually, talk um, to people. You can find me on Twitter as all Z cool stuff. But truth be told, I never use it. I know. Right? You know. I am on Instagram as Super Dude Dave Tree. But again, I never really use Instagram. Uh, I am on Facebook, but the coolest place to find me is actually on the Fanthatrax YouTube channel, which yeah. is just literally Fanthatrax. And then on there, you will see a couple of bits and pieces from myself and other Fanthatrax members, but predominantly Martin Keeler, who has been pumping out and doing a whole amazing job we've hit 400 subscribers today that is great and if we can get the five people that listen to this to also subscribe then that will take us to 405 subscribers i would set of which... 80 percent of our <laughs> listenership right now to get us to 404 i'd take that i really would I'd oh yeah yeah um please check out as mark mentioned earlier in the interview we're going to start playing around with a few ideas of like linking in the podcast which you can also listen to the podcast on the youtube channels as well Very true. so uh, i may be saying this and you'll be might maybe like looking at your screen going well uh duh i am actually on youtube li- already listening to you but also we're then cross fertilizing like interviews and bits and pieces on there so we're trying to like yeah spread the love and engage in all, all different areas as mark mentions i have a toy shop uh i'm on the edge of the uh, new forest in hampshire it's called all the cool stuff we run a show called Fathers From three times a year. The next one's coming up in August, first weekend, 4th and 5th. 4th is Panther Day. 5th is Fathers From, which is a retro toy show dedicated to Star Wars toys from the 70s and 80s. Find us everywhere. You start messaging me on Twitter and on Instagram, and I will start using them again. Give me a reason to use these things. Mark, where can I find you? You can find me on Twitter at prefect underscore timing. Prefect, because I'm a hitchhiker's fan. Prefect underscore timing on Facebook it's Mark uh, Newbold I think which is probably logical because that's my name but usually you will find me on the Fantatrax Twitter feed so that's uh, usually any nonsense random words that anybody outside the UK doesn't understand it's probably come from me and I should put my initials on there more but I don't so apologies but that's where you find me and I'm always out there somewhere writing something doing whatnot and stuff we will be back in two weeks time if we have a chance, we might try and slot another one in before then because I've got some audio that I'd like to get out before then. So you and me, Dave, we may be speaking before then unless one of the other guys is free, in which case it'll be somebody else. But no, no it'll be you. Yeah, and, and we'll, be, we'll be back. We will be back as it goes in two weeks' time. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Five-star reviews. And uh, I'll let you sign off for this time, Dave, because you're, you're a professional. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for uh, joining us on the third episode. As Mark said, we will see you again in two weeks time again please leave us any reviews across the various different formats and also please drop us a line give us like your thoughts and feedback and i will read them out on the show even if mark both good or bad indifferent anything that you'd like to see or improve on get it out there let's talk star wars if you can go see solo again i know it costs money but like come on star wars on the big screen it's really cool also you're not going to see anything for another like year and a half so like why not push the boat out come on if 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 our four listeners can like get out there and like listen to uh watch another episode of solo uh, yeah oh let's do that Let's, let's do a huge group viewing of solo in fact i'd be up for that if anybody else is let's do it i'd be up for that but thank you for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode